Um, I was saying before in the, uh, I guess the social time before uh, the lecture, uh, I have to really hand it off to Dentistry Academy. It's, it's all about collaboration. And it's just amazing that you guys have been able to, to unite so many dentists that have, you know, been going through some pretty tough times these last two months. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, allowing me to share my passion for dentistry. And uh, I really hope for all the attendees today that uh, you get uh, a lot out of today's presentation. Uh, it's only 45 minutes to an hour. Usually this is a day or two lecture, but uh, I want to give you guys a ton of pearls. And uh, without further ado, let, let's get started here. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to uh, email me. Here's my uh, email address. Uh, my inbox gets uh, kind of full with you know a bunch of work stuff too. So if you want to get at me faster, just um, send me a DM on Instagram. Um, I, I check that often. And uh, um, yeah, we can, we can connect there further. And so um, as Sham said, right before PDC, like literally two days before PDC, I got back from India on a dental brigade. Um, I'm not from India, but man, I love that country. It is insane. I've been there three times. It's just, you know, sensory overload. And, and I'm like, man, we have to do a dental brigade there. And so we went to rural India, like the real India where they've never even seen foreigners before and and uh, we were like little celebrities walking down the street everyone gathers around to take photos and it's it was, it was really fun um but it was it was insane man like there's there's cows walking on the street right right next to the clinic and it was really cool so we were working in a hospital and uh there's a little video of the hospital here um we did a lot of uh a little bit of everything you know hygiene extractions uh fillings and and i love bringing people from my uh, team like at the office and then we started a scholarship program at the University of Saskatchewan where we bring a couple dental students with us and uh, and it just it just pumps everyone up and it's my favorite time of year I try to go a couple times a year and, and it's, it's cool the more interesting part for me I, I found was beyond just dentistry um, about four years ago I optometrists started coming with us too and that makes such a huge difference like you, you never we, we take teeth for granted like we know how to fix teeth it's it's you know part of our everyday but i had no idea the power of optometry man like you you put glasses on people that I have not seen before haven't seen in years or on little kids like get to see their parents for the first time like they just you don't even know what they were seeing before and then now it's just like the shock of amazement and it just I, I'm speechless, man. You can tell it's, it's amazing. So if you haven't been on a dental brigade before, I highly encourage you guys. It's, it's, it's a way to get back, uh, get, get back to your soul and get back to your, your true power of our profession. Um, like Sham said, man, it, my, pa my, my passion started, started 10 years ago and it started on a, on a trip to Guatemala and I was just looking for an adventure. And then 10 years later, I've been on, on 19 of these now. And, and it just, there's something about it that keeps me going back every single time. And man, it, it's, that's where my heart is, man. It's, it's about helping people that don't have the ability to give anything back to you. And that's what makes you feel good. And that's what, that's what we're all on earth to do. We're all on earth to share our skills. And I highly encourage any dentist that wants to, or isn't interested in this to, to just reach out and, and uh, I can see if we can like, you know, travel together and, and uh, I love meeting more people. And, and um, yeah, I'd love, I hope you guys can reconnect to your profession this way. Um, and I don't have to explain to you guys the power of our profession. Like um, this was a 14 or 15 year old girl that was actually getting married. And just with a couple composites, she's able to smile for her wedding day and she's in tears just from something that we take, you know, for granted every day. Of course, this isn't your, your Instagram worthy stuff, but this is everyday life, man. And, and this is what we do, you know, in Guatemala and, and we help provide people with smiles. And so, yeah, I, uh, um, it, it, it's awesome. Um, however, five years ago, I started getting really frustrated that the lines never ended. And there was just so many, like there was so many people to help and I felt like I wasn't making a dent. I actually, you know, caught myself in a little bit of a depression there and, and, and couldn't figure out how I could help more or what I was doing wrong. And then it, it really clicked for me that you see these common trends of dehydration and malnutrition and sickness and children and women aren't, you know, going to work or going to school. They're actually going to get water every day. 
and that broke my heart, man. Like kids not going to school just because of water. And man, why don't we just give them water? Why can't we figure out a solution for that? We we're resourceful people. And so I made it my mission. And in a drought stricken area in Guatemala, or sorry, in Nicaragua, um, I made it a goal. I'm going to get um, this community fresh water. And so I teamed up with an organization out of Edmonton and, um, you know, it was like 10, 10, 12,000 bucks to drill a water well. Like who cares, right? Let's, let's do this. And so we gathered all the people together, we drilled a water well and there it was like, it, it was, this to me was the, the true power of our profession. Our profession is not about teeth. Our profession is about our ability to, to unite people and, and if you are a new grad or if you're new out in dentistry, I know you don't quite understand this yet, but dentistry is not about teeth. Dentistry is about people. And once you learn to understand that, you will get so much more pride out of your profession and so much more self, like self pride that, that you're doing something and that you're making a difference. And that's what I want to share with you guys. You don't have to drill water wells. You don't have to go down to Central America or India and fix teeth. We all have the ability to change someone's today, someone's tomorrow, and someone's forever. And so I, I really encourage you, just mow your neighbor's lawn, man. Like, go, go find something that you want to help people with beyond teeth and, and, and make that difference. And I, I really hope I, I connect with you guys and, and you guys come with me on some of these trips because... I feel like I'm just on the verge of, 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 of making this even bigger. And uh, like we said, we've drilled, sorry, we've drilled about 15 wells so far, but I want to expand the project and, and I want to, uh, I want to incorporate dentistry in the exact, in the exact same uh, towns that we do uh, water wells in. And, and I just think we can make such a huge impact together. So I look forward to meeting you guys, uh, meeting you guys on that level. But for today, we're here to talk about wisdom teeth, my passion, man, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, this was what was killing me during COVID. I couldn't get back, back to work and, and start pulling wisdom teeth. Um, I hope these videos are showing up for you guys today uh, really well. I know it can be tricky over Zoom, but um, I, I just really want to show you guys some tips and tricks today. Like I said, I only got 45 minutes, but I'm going to show you uh, some good pearls. And I think the pearls are going to be different for everyone because if you have more experience, you'll understand some of them right away. Um, but if you're just starting out, some of the stuff may just go a little bit over your head because you haven't, you know, got yourself in those sticky situations yet. And so uh, I kind of want to make it broad and, and, uh, and hopefully share, uh, share some tips, tips with everyone today. My, my first part that I start every lecture with is that this lecture is for GPs by a GP. I do not pretend to be an oral surgeon and I am damn proud of being a GP. We've, uh, we've built, like I spent years building relationships with all my patients, with, all my, with, with my community. I coach basketball, you volunteer everywhere, everyone knows you and they trust you and they're in your chair right now because they trust you. And so why would you want to send them to a stranger when they want to see you and they, they're, they're there for you to help them and they feel so much more comfortable with you? And so I really feel um, GPs need to take more pride and, and uh, you know, develop their skills enough in all different facets of dentistry where, where you can see them. Um, with that being said, um, wisdom teeth are different than a lot of other parts of dentistry. And I don't want to be blunt, so I don't mean to be a dick, but like check your ego at the door, okay? This, taking out wisdom teeth, you don't need to like leave your ego out the door. No one cares, okay? If you're going to be taking out you know, upside down third molars on seven year old guys that are full bony impacted, like, yeah, that may look great and that may make you feel good, but then you're going to be babysitting them for the next six weeks as they're in pain. And, and you know, there's cases that we don't always have to do, or, or we don't have to do dependent on your training. So um, there will be many cases that you should refer on to someone who's more experienced than you until you gain that experience. And so it, it's really important to understand that um, you know, taking uh, courses here and there does not substitute, uh, you know, an entire residency. So I want to be able to teach you guys to take out teeth easily and efficiently um, and know which ones to take on. It's know which ones to say, you know what, this is, this is beyond my scope. Um, I, don't, I don't feel, you know, ready to handle the complications of what could happen. And so maybe I shouldn't be taking this, this case on. And, and that will change as you get, as you, uh, 
you know, gain experience and, and gain your skills. So, um, yeah, there's, there's no prize for taking out the hardest tooth. There's just a headache because there's a lot of complications with that too. So I just want everyone to understand that. So third molars, I, I, I tried to come up with, uh, you know, five, five really good uh, tips and tricks and, and that I could apply to everyone. And of course, everyone's at different skill levels. Um, but the first one is get your damn patient frozen because all of your stories, all your horror stories you hear of wisdom teeth are, it hurt like hell. And then the dentist got on the chair and he's standing on top of me and yanking on this tooth. And we all know that's not true, but like how many people, I've, it's a shocking amount of people that have told this to me. So there must be someone out in Alberta doing it. So uh, I don't know. I, I don't want that to be me, but uh, get, get profound anesthesia before you start. And so this is a great tip for people who aren't doing sedation. So I, I practice IV sedation, two drug IV sedation. Um, not every case needs IV sedation, but some cases need more than IV sedation and, and need GA. And so um, we're not going to go into that uh, today, but uh, let's just pretend our patient just needs local. And so uh, when we talk about local anesthesia, I really encourage you guys to consider buffering your anesthetics. Um, what buffering your anesthetic means is we're basically increasing the pH of our anesthetic. So it's more of a, you know, a basic solution instead of an acidic solution or more of a neutral solution. And the reason for this is when we buffer our anesthetics, we actually decrease the onset time of actual local anesthetic action. It, it occurs so much faster. So a normal block, like IA block, takes eight and a half minutes to kick in. But with the, IA, with the uh, buffered solution, it actually kicks in after two minutes. And that's huge, especially when, you know, you, you're in a busy day and you don't want to wait, you know, uh, a long time to get get things frozen. So I apply this to all all facets of dentistry, not just uh, not just third molars. And then the also the other part of buffering your anesthetic is we need to reduce the pain associated with it. You all know dentistry is a hundred percent about perception. If we can give that patient that experience that that they're after to to make them say, you know what, maybe getting my wisdom teeth out wasn't so bad hey, you should go see Dr. Jamal. He knows how to take out wisdom teeth. It was fast, didn't even hurt that bad. The needles weren't even that bad. That, that, that's huge. And as Dr. Ling was saying in the, in the intro, um, it's, it's all about being the, the gold standard in your community. And I'm excited for that presentation there, Dr. Ling. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that too. Um, so uh, I encourage you guys to buffer your anesthetics. And I wanna show you guys how to do that uh, today real quick here. Um, so the standard local, um, like. Uh, lidocaine is a pH of 4.2, so it's more of an acidic pH. Uh, when we buffer it, we actually increase the pH to 7. It's more of a physiological pH. So how does this work, okay? And why aren't the company already sending me a buffered anesthetic? So inside your anesthetic carp, we have uncharged lipid-soluble uh, uh, molecules, and we have charged water-soluble molecules. So because of the... Uh, you know, we have to, they have to send the carp in a stable form. Um, it has to be in a water soluble, um, water soluble form. So there's more charged solutions. So unfortunately, this means that the solution has to be acidic for it to be fully soluble. When we raise the pH of the solution, um, if you leave it for a couple hours, you'll see a precipitate forms. And so it's not stable if you leave it at a higher pH. So I know a lot of people have questions about that. And so the, the manufacturer has to lower the pH in order for it to stay stable. But what we want to do is through the addition of sodium bicarbonate, which you can buy at the pharmacy for like 40 bucks for a 50 mil, uh, 50 mil vial, we can inject it into our carpool. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And we can shift the equation. I'm sure you guys all remember your Henderson Hasselbalch equation from, uh, you know, first year chemistry, which I do not want to revisit here today. But um, yeah, we shift the equation, you know, the pH pKa, um, and we uh, shift the equation to a more uncharged lipid soluble form that is able to cross the membrane and cause anesthesia. So it, it's as easy as this. And I have a video for you guys too. Uh, it's just an insulin syringe, a 1cc insulin syringe. You put it into the sodium bicarbonate, draw up, I don't know, a mil if you're going to do five uh, five carps, and you inject 0 0.2, 0 0.2 cc into each uh, lidocaine carpule, and you'll actually see the stopper push out just a little bit. And so I want to show you guys that today. So remember, we're doing the buffering 
because we want to decrease the onset time so we can get started faster because we all have patients in the day, okay? And it also decreases the pain associated with the injection. So what my assistant does, I don't do any of this. My assistant does this at the beginning of the day for the morning. If I have, I don't know, four or five sets of third molars, I only, I only use this for the, for the bottom. So she'll make like maybe 10 carbs. And uh, um, yeah, it's, it's as easy as that. Get your assistant to do it before you, start, before you start the day. That way you don't have to worry about it. But remember, the longer you leave it, a precipitate will form and then it's kind of toast. So you don't want to do it prepared for the next day. Just prepare it for the morning. So it's just an uh, insulin syringe here. Uh, wipe the ends of the uh, sodium bicarb vial and your um, lidocaine, lidocaine tip there. You draw up, I should have sped up this video, sorry guys. <laughs> um, you draw up one, one cc or however many carbs you want to do for that day. And it's crazy after PDC, so many people were like, man, send me this video, send me this video. And, and I was shocked because I'm like, it's not rocket science. You, you literally just inject, you're injecting that right into your carpule. And you're going to see, watch the stopper here. Watch the stopper at the end here, right here. Watch it push out. But you're not pushing it out all the way. You're only adding 0.2 cc. So it pushes out a little bit, but there's also, there's, there's spring inside your, uh, inside your anesthetic syringe where you can pull it out a little bit further. So there's no issues with that. Um, I highly encourage you guys uh, to, you know, consider buffering your anesthetic. It will lead to more profound anesthesia and you will notice it, a difference faster. You keep those patients comfortable and those patients come back and you're a hero. Uh, we both know, you know, we all have tough times getting out teeth here and there, but if the patient's frozen, everyone's stress is lower. Okay, so get your patients frozen. This is a great tip. I use it all the time. Uh, as far as max dosages go, um, I like to mix my anesthetics. I, I really believe in using Rupivacaine. And if you practice dentistry long enough, you'll, you'll agree with me that after you take out third molars or, you know, you do an endo or you're a little unsure, um, you know, if they're going to be in pain after, always end with Rupivacaine. It's a longer lasting anesthetic, um, also called Marcaine. And uh, um, it, it I think it really helps. Um, there's in the States, there's, I forgot the name of the drug, but they actually, it's bupivacaine in, inside liposomes. And then you inject the light, you inject the solution on the buckles of after you take out the third molars. Studies show it doesn't do anything more than a normal uh, bupivacaine um, injection. So I encourage you guys to, to inject bupivacaine around there. But after you take out, you know, uh, all four third molars and the patient's awake and maybe they weren't, you know, frozen enough. You give them some more. You, sometimes you get nervous about dosages and especially if you're mixing anesthetics. So I heard, I, I want everyone to pull out their smartphones right now and download this app. Um, it's a free app. Um, it, it's basically a local anesthetic calculator. And then there's a bunch of stuff in there about uh, medical emergencies and stuff that are great to go through when, when uh, you're bored, but uh, download that app and uh, it allows you to, uh, tell like you put in the weights of the patient and then you put in what types of anesthetic you're going to use and it tells you you know how much you have until you hit the max dose and um, this is usually what I do uh, for my third molars I over freeze and I'm proud of it and I, I know I'm injecting you know a local anesthetic into that patient but I hate it when patients feel or they're feel anything or they jump. I'd rather have that patient frozen and say, you know, man, that kid was frozen for like six hours after I saw you. And then I say, well, did you feel anything? And they say, nope. And I say, okay, sounds like it worked. And, and uh, that's just me. You don't have to give this much freezing, but obviously dependent on weight of the patient and overall medical condition and ASA status. Uh, I won't go into all that, but this is, this is what I do. I always end with uh, a carp of Pivacaine on the lower eights on each side. People don't feel pain with upper eights. It's always the lower, lower third molars that people are gonna have an issue with. And so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how I, I give that um, anesthetic along the flap there in a little bit here. But um, that, that's all I wanna talk to you guys about, about anesthetic. So just get your patient frozen. Um, consider IV sedation if, uh, if that's, you know, as you get further in your career. I think that's totally changed my life. And uh, I, I love it so much.
but uh, we won't talk about that. Uh, so third molars, how to tell the difficulty of a third molar exo. And this changes for everyone because everyone has different levels of experience, but I want to give you guys a couple tips that will, I just want to say save your ass because it's, it's, as I look at pans, I look at comines, it, it saves mine and uh, you know, what to take on, what to refer, what, what you think you're going to have problems with. And so, we have, a, we have a, of course, you look at the upper one, you're like, okay, sideways, um, might, be, might be tricky, may just roll out to the buckle, who knows, right? Um, but we're talking about lowers here, lower. So we, we look at this third molar, if you can see, it's, it's distal angular, okay? Okay, so things that I look at, at a pan here, I'm thinking, well, I can't take the tooth out this way, it's gonna go into the ramus here. Okay, I'm looking at the inferior alveolar nerve bundle, is this gonna be an issue? I can see a white line here, and then I don't see much here. Maybe it gets darker there, I can't tell. You can see a solid white line there. I'm looking at the space between here. Because the problem is when you go to split these teeth, you can't get a bird to come this way. Physics doesn't allow you that. And also, the patient doesn't have unlimited opening skills. So, um, distal angular teeth are, are quite difficult. And, and there's ways to take them out. And there's, you know, unfortunately, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of struggle sometimes. But distal angular teeth can, can, be, can be taken out. You just have to know, like, how to take them out properly and how to take them out safely. Con continually reefing on someone's jaw is just going to lead to uh, a lot of pain and uh, a lot of pull stop problems. And so I hope you guys can see this video right now. I don't know how choppy it is on Zoom. Um, but if you'll see, I use a 45 degree angled handpiece for everything. I'm a GP. This is what I was trained on. I do have a straight handpiece, but having this 45 degree, just like all of you, we can just connect it to our units and we're off to the races. So I have, a, I have a, a bunch of them, but I highly encourage you guys, if you are going to use a 45 degree angled handpiece, I want everyone to get electric handpieces. Electric handpieces revolutionize dental surgery. If I didn't have an electric handpiece, I'd be using a straight electric handpiece. And so I, I have no problems using a 45 degree angle handpiece. Of course, there's, you know, situations where you have to use a straight handpiece, but it, it's quite easy. And then we use, we put PRF in the socket and uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about all this here. So there's so many factors involved. Like, how do you know, looking at a pan, like what is going to be hard? What is going to be easy? And so I just want to focus on four real quick. Okay, so looking at this tooth, we see it's horizontal there, and horizontal tends to scare so many people. And everyone says, oh, your teeth are sideways. Those are going to be brutal. And patients automatically can think of that too. Oh, my teeth are sideways. These are going to hurt like hell to take out. And it doesn't have to be that way. So um, I just want to share with you guys a, a couple, couple tips here. So angulation, easiest to hardest. Mesioangular, easiest, okay? Distoangular, hardest. And we're going to talk about why distal angulars are the hardest. And, and a lot of it has to do with you try to deliver it to the distal and it doesn't go. You try to split that tooth, but you can't get to the percation to split it. You end up taking away a lot more bone because you're struggling to, to you know, get this tooth out of there. And it just doesn't you know, work well for anyone. So mesial angular is the easiest. The horizontals aren't actually that bad. You just have to learn to take them out properly. And, and in our full day, uh, multi-day courses like we we show you guys how to how to split them and, and how to take them out uh, easily but i only have 45 minutes here so i can't cover everything and then distal angulars are the hardest we're going to talk about that in two seconds here age a simple rule of thumb okay under 25 it's not going to be as bad as if they were over 25 that is just a simple rule of thumb everyone is different um but i just find when i get referrals on my desk the first thing that's you see there's birthday and you're like oh shit they're 45, they're distal angular, might be tough versus, you know, they're 18, distal angular, okay, at least I'll, be, I'll have the ability to pop them out. Sometimes there's still a, like, you know, there's follicle around there, the PDL space is a lot wider um, and the bone just isn't nearly as hard. And so this is just it. So we look at, we look at this third molar and I don't know about you, but I lose the roots in here. I have no idea where the root starts and where the root stops. You can see the IAN down there, but sometimes these teeth can be tricky. And when you can't see any PDL space, unfortunately, this was, this was about, a, a, I think it was about 75. You can't see PDL space and you start pushing on that tooth and you hear a crack. 
yeah, it, it, you, you often take a chunk of bone out of it. And you'll more often see this on, you know, upper tuberosities. And uh, I have some great slides about tuberosity fractures that I won't share with you today because, you know, that's embarrassing. But <laughs> I got some big tuberosities out there and I'm sure you guys all have too. And uh, like I said, it's, it's part of the game. You just have to minimize, uh, minimize it, of course. But this is key. If you get anything out of today, when you start looking at pants, I want you to start looking at this. Okay, so let's look at this mesioangular uh, impacted tooth here. Look at the space in between the second molar and the third molar, okay? You see the crown is touching the root, but look down here, okay? Look at all that bone. What, oops, sorry. What that is, is access, okay? My application point is here. Because this tooth is mesioangular, I can show you guys how to split it here properly and effectively every time to hit the furcation, okay? We can take that tooth out easily. That tooth is not difficult, okay? There will be a little bit of bone overlying the distal, but that, that's not hard. This tooth is much easier. This is a mesioangular tooth, and this is why the mesioangular teeth are a lot easier. But why are distoangular teeth so hard? So look here, okay? Look at the distance between the second molar root and your third molar root. Do you see how they are almost touching, okay? You have zero access. There is, there is not very much access in there. When you go to split this tooth, okay, you're gonna think you're hitting the furcation and you're gonna do one of these splits right here because the, the patient can't open up, you know, all the way. And you can't get your burr to go like this. Like, you, you drill just can't do that. You're gonna hit the top tooth and your, your, your burr doesn't physically go that way. And so you're gonna end up cutting a piece here and it's not gonna move and you need to get to this furcation and then you can't. And you're going to keep on going, you're going to keep on going, you're going to try to split the crown, try to get to the furcation, and you're still only cutting it here, and you're struggling. And then you're going to break the tooth off here. You'll get the distal root, but then you'll break the mesial off here, and then you're toast. The reason you're toast is because you cannot see that root for the life of you, because all you can see is the distal edge of this crown. This is why distal angulars are hard. It's access. It's access and it's visibility. And when you can't get in there to see anything, how are you supposed to take it out? And then you start drilling buckle bone away because you're like, well, maybe if I go along the buckle, I can get to it. Now you're just creating a mess. I hope you guys understand that, okay? This is so key. Every single pan you look at now, look at the distance between the second molar and the third molar, and I really feel you'll save yourself a lot of headache. If, you know, you're, you're, you're newer starting out taking out third molars maybe this isn't the case i would start with because this is going to be a, a pretty tough tooth um, and then the other thing i want to tell you is when teeth are erupted they're a lot harder to take out when they're impacted and that's because they've had years of chewing on that tooth the bone gets harder around there i think that they're a lot, a lot harder erupted third molars are difficult impacted third molars are easier but then access is more difficult and so I'd be careful of this tooth here only because I think it, it would be difficult. Would I still take it out? Yes. Um, but I would warn the patient, you know, it's going to break a couple times. It's going to be hard to get in there. It's not coming out in two minutes. You got to make sure they're really frozen. Consider sedation, of course. Um, yeah. So I want you guys to understand that. But what about the nerve? And I hear this so often. Uh, I'll have, you know, patients come to me and they say, my dentist sent me to you because my wisdom teeth were in the nerve. And the the dentist is telling the patient that they're in the nerve. And so let's, let's clarify this a little bit. Uh, we all know as dentists, the teeth aren't a lot of them, you know, some of them, the, the nerve goes through the tooth, but the teeth aren't in the nerve. They're just in close proximity to the nerve. And when you look on a pan, it's easy to tell the patient, hey, look, your wisdom teeth in the nerve. You're gonna have to go, yeah, I don't wanna deal with it. You know what I mean? And so let's, let's get around that here. So we're looking for the most part at pans and I've studied pans so much and I've read so many papers on how to, you know, dissect just looking at a pan, how this tooth is going to be. And what I've come up with is that they're all crap because you can't see what you want to on a pan. And I hear it so often and people are like, well, I see the two white lines of the IAN, like of the nerve bundle. And then I know the nerve's not in the way, so I'm good to go. Okay, that's fine. Um, what about here? Can you see the line of the IAM? I'm unsure, I, I really don't know. I think it's gonna depend on the quality of the pen. Um, but I think there's, there's three factors over all the research that I've read and my own personal, um, my own 
I guess my own personal experience, there's three factors that, uh, that I want to talk to you about. So this is going to be like a typical patient that we get, you know, he comes sees you Monday morning and he says, dude, I've been in pain all weekend. I need this tooth out of here. And they show up and they, they expect you to take it out. I'm not getting referred. I need this damn tooth out of my head right now. And so what are you going to do? And what are you going to tell the patient in relation to that? Like the tooth being so close to that nerve. And so these are the three issues. We're going to look at darkening of the root. Is the root darker as the IAN passes through it? But we'll still see the white lines like we just said before. And a lot of people say, you know, as long as I can see the white lines of the IAN, I'm safe. I don't have to worry about it. But if that root is darker and you still see those, those lines there, I, I consider something else, not just the nerve. And I'll talk about that in a sec. And what if you see, like in the previous x-ray, an interruption of the white lines of the canal? I think that's, that's an issue. And a lot of research shows that that could, be an, that could be an issue of a possible nerve, like nerve associated with the tooth. And then if you see the actual nerve, like the IN nerve bundle, move when the, when the tooth, like it, it, it's around the, I'll just show you a picture. <laughs> Okay, so we can, I can't see all the uh, pictures here because my screen is here, I'll move that up. Yeah, so um, when you look here, you see, you know, diversion of the root, you can still see the white lines here. So we'll see darkening of the root, but we still see the white lines. When you see a diversion of the canal, so do you see how, how the canal diverges down here? Even a little bit here. I would consider that to be a little bit risky. Uh, when it comes to taking that tooth out. And then clearly when you see an interruption of the white line, that would be, that would be risky as well. But, sorry, but how are you supposed to know that? And looking at a pan, half the time, I can't tell either. And so th this is a typical case you're gonna get. You're gonna sit and you're gonna get, so Neki, are these lower eights in the nerve? And what do you guys think? So let's look at this tooth here. I see a white line here. I see a darkened root. I do not see a white line there. And so it's hard for me to tell. And I don't think that there, there is a proper way to tell based off a pen. What about this one here? We see the white lines of the tooth, or white lines of the IAN canal. And we are taught to say, you know what? I don't think it's associated with the nerve. And that is the truth. It, it isn't associated with the nerve, but it is associated with something else. When you see these two white lines here, more often than not, I'm talking like high 90% of the time, there's a thinning of the cortical, cortical bone associated with that root. And what that means is, and I'm gonna show you a cone beam of this in a second. Oops. I'm gonna show you a cone beam of this in a second. You're actually gonna see the roots embed themselves into the cortical plate or they could actually be protruding uh, outside that cortical plate. So that cortical plate is extremely thin around that tooth. So if you push on that tooth in the wrong position, you may lose that root into the soft tissue beyond, like into the floor of the mouth. And if you wanna talk about your heart racing, that, that'll, that'll make it happen really quick. And so I want you guys to be careful of that, but I'm gonna show you this here, sorry. And what about this one here? We're looking at the 3-8. How do you split this tooth? I'm not so worried about, not so much worried about the nerve here, but you're looking at third molars beyond just the, beyond just the, you know, the inferior alveolar nerve bundle. How the hell do you know what's going on here? How am I going to get a burr down here to split this tooth? This patient's in pain. You can see there's caries on there. She's referred them like your another dentist referred them to you to take that tooth out because they know that they can't split that tooth. And so do you start having the conversation with the patient? Hey, I'm going to leave a chunk of your tooth in there. Um, because I don't think I'll be able to get all of it out. Or do you just need to know a little bit more of the story? And that's where I take comb beams. And I don't think, to be clear, right off the bat, I don't think every patient needs a comb beam. But I really feel like comb beams add so much value. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, they, they critique this, this thought and they say, well, does it really change the way that you take your teeth out? And I say, yeah, it does. Because I know if there's a third root on there, I know exactly what that tooth looks like. If that tooth is into a cortical plate, I know where to push on it. I know where I have to be careful. So I highly, I, I highly, um, I guess I will go up to any, anyone and, and tell them, I, I think I have enough, um, 
uh, I would much rather say. <laughs> I think I have enough, uh, you know, moral ground to take a CVCT in for third molar cases when I think that a pan just isn't providing enough information because it allows me to comprehensively treatment plan this this third molar a lot easier um, than just a simple pan alone. So what, what a CBCT tells me, I'm looking at the buccal lingual position of the canal, okay? I'm looking at the relation of the canal to the two, so I know that I'm not really concerned here. When I get concerned, okay, what, I get this question a lot, when do I have to, you know, start to get worried that my tooth is too close to the, um, uh, to the IA canal? And that's when you lose cortication of the canal on your x-ray. So you'll see, the, you'll see the canal and it's corticated all around there. I'm not worried about it as much as when you lose the cortication around the canal in relation to your tooth. That makes me a little nervous. And I just tell the patient beforehand, I'm like, hey, this is a high risk tooth. And you go over pros and cons and you make the decision with your patient on, on what you're going to take on or what you're going to leave. Um, and then lastly, I'm always looking at the thickness of my cortical plates here. If I have a root embedded in the cortical plate and this plate is very thin and I'm pushing on this tooth lingually because I've broken it and I'm trying to you know, pry it out of there, what if I push it right down here? Well, that's a bad day. But how do you know that until you have all the information? So I think taking a comb beam tells us so much more of the story and I highly encourage you guys, if you are gonna take on a case and you're a little unsure, get the full story no one is ever going to blame you for you know knowing exactly what's going on your patients are going to appreciate it so much that you care enough that you want to get the full story before you take out that tooth this is about their safety and this is about your stress level and so i always encourage you guys to have all your information so get your cbct so let's go back and revisit these cases we look at the 38 here and you can see remember on this x-ray here we can see it just darkening along the root. I don't know if there, I could still see the top line of the, uh, like, you know, the radio opaque line. And we can see actual grooving here of the, of the tooth. And the IA goes right in between these roots. And so, yeah, that's, that's a, a high stress case. And patient, patient's mom was adamant that we take them out. I warned of, you know, possible paresthesia. And man, did I take my time and I was, I was pretty nervous taking, taking this out. But uh, this is why we have a comb beam. I know that there's three roots. I know exactly what I need to go after here. What about this one here? I know I'm not gonna be able to split it down here. I don't have a burr long enough. I don't feel like drilling that entire tooth out of there and I don't wanna go digging for this piece here. So why don't we just take a comb beam? So from there, we can see it's all just one tooth. When you split this tooth, it is all just one tooth. You can see it curve around here. So all we're seeing is, is bone inside that tooth, but it doesn't look like that on the x-ray here. And so in all actuality, I just removed a tiny bit of buccal bone and popped that tooth up and that tooth came out in three seconds. It's all just one piece. And so without a comb beam, we just don't have all the information. This is what I'm nervous about. When I take a comb beam on a patient, I'm going to, I'm going to pause it in a spot here. You see one root, you can see the eye right through here. You can see one root. Now continue to look here, and you're gonna see the other two roots here. And so that nerve literally transverses right through that tooth. That's a high risk tooth. I'm not touching that one. So this, these are the things I'm looking for. On a pan, you may not see that. And so this is, this is why I think the value of a comb beam really shines, just looking at this, this right here. And then lastly, this one here where we see two radio opaque lines. This is what I want to stress to you guys. They're not always as easy as you think they are. Oh, I'm missing the comb beam on, or no, sorry. Comb beam's coming up right after this. These are the three things I want you to look out for. We don't see, we see darkening of the root and the radio opaque line is still intact. Because remember, these are the three signs that we're looking for on our pans. And when we look at the comb beam here, this is that same tooth. Remember what I said, when you still see the white line, you're gonna see a thinning of the cortical plate and you can see the roots are right in the cortical plate there. If you push on them the wrong way, if you push on it a little bit too hard, you're gonna lose that root right down here. I hope you guys all can see that and all understand that. And this is that pan right there. 
So you can't tell the cortical plate thickness off this. But when I see the white lines here, I'm always nervous about cortical plate thickness and I'm never pushing apically. And you should never push apically with third molars anyway. But that's, uh, that's what we're looking at. Okay, now let's get into it. Access is 90% of the battle. It's all about making an appropriate size flap. So flaps have to be, I guess, as large as possible, but as small as necessary. Uh, we need to be able to see what we're doing, um, but we don't need to be, no, I said that backwards. As small as possible, but lar as large as necessary. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so flaps have to be as small as possible, but large as necessary. We don't want to create these massive flaps where we unglove the entire mandible to take out a third molar. Um, you don't have to do that. You just need to be able to see your tooth and safely take that tooth out. And so it all begins with proper flap design. I like to minimize trauma, but I need to maximize what I can see. If you cannot get a tooth out, 80% of the time, it's because you can't see the whole area enough. Um, if, if, you can, if you're constantly fighting with your soft tissue, your flap is probably either not large enough or you've torn it and now you're, you know, you almost have a split thickness, like you have half periosteum on this part, but it's full thickness on the other part, and it's just a messy flap. So I really encourage you guys, put pressure uh, when you're using your scalpel blade all the way to the bone and make sure it's a clean flap, single stroke. Before you reflect your flap, I wanna give you guys a really good tip to make your flap fold right off your tissue, and that's by using what we call a hydraulic flap. So what a hydraulic flap means is, is that I want you to take anesthetic and I want you to inject all along here and make this flap bubble. You're gonna see it bubble off, uh, bubble off the bone. So you're going all the way to the bone, below the periosteum, and you inject a couple drops and you're gonna see all the gums here bubble off. And then when you go to reflect it, it's so clean and it just falls right off, right off the bone. And so you have a full thickness flap it's not messy. It really helps you. A lot of people say that they have difficulty with their flaps trying to, you know, pull it off the bone. And, and this is my trick. It's hydraulic flap. You can apply this anywhere in the mouth, um, especially, you know, for implantology or, or bone or soft tissue grafting. Um, if you are going to require a full thickness flap, inject anesthetic all along this tissue here, make that tissue bubble, get all the way to the periosteum, and then pull back and it just falls right off the bone. So this is my standard incision. This is my third molar flap. And we've all heard of this, the hockey stick, hockey stick flap. And so I like to go one tooth ahead. I know a lot of people, they'll just make another incision down here. But I find when I do that, I get more food in the socket um, over the healing period. And I find that people take longer to heal if they do that. And there's no right and wrong way to do it. it it's, it's your comfort level. So um, I, I encourage you guys to, to try what, what works for you. This is what works for me. And so I've injected the flap all along here, just a couple drops all along the way. Incision here with a 15 blade. And then at this corner, I make a hockey stick. Okay, what a hockey stick means, it's almost like a 45 degree incision. And when I first started taking out third molars, this is what was killing me. Because I, was, I thought I was making my hockey stick incision, but just due to the angle of everything, my incision was more like this. And I thought I was 45 degrees, but I wasn't even close. I was maybe like 20 degrees. But if you actually get a, a proper 45 degree here, you'll see this whole area just folds back and it opens up really easily. Um, for my scalpel handle, I encourage everyone to change their weight, <laughs> their normal scalpel handles. Um, I had an assistant when I first started doing third molars. She was a new grad. I was a couple of years out. I wasn't the most experienced. And when she was taking the blade off my scalpel handle, you know, my rectangular scalpel handle, she, I don't know what she was doing, but she missed, like she slipped and it cut her entire palm. And really whose fault is that? It's mine. I didn't train her well enough. I probably didn't even know how to take one off well enough. And, um, and she was hurt, man. She went to the hospital. I felt horrible. The patient, we had to call the patient. They had to go get, you know, their, testing done because it was a, a medical cut. And so I encourage everyone to use this. This is my favorite scalpel handle. It's by Carl Schumacher. It's called the drop blade scalpel handle. And I'll show you how it works here. I love round bladed uh, scalpel handles. You have so much more dexterity. 
And look at this, there's a little spring on the end and it's just so cool. You just depress the handle and it shoots off the blade. If you wanna talk about safety now more than ever, get the scalpel handle where you cannot mess it up, where your assistants cannot, um, cannot cut themselves. I encourage you to, uh, to look it up. It's by Carl Schumacher. Um, we're gonna talk about that uh, in a couple minutes. Um, at the end, I, uh, I I've arranged something awesome for all the dentistry uh, folks here. So let's talk about a flap. Um, this is a typical case that we'll see. And so I just wanna show you uh, a quick and easy flap. I do not flap all the way to the angle of the mandible. Like I said, I make my flaps as small as possible, but as large as necessary that I need to see. And so I always start one tooth ahead. You can see my 45 degrees there. I'm sorry, I'm taking, uh, I'm making this flap literally by looking at it through a camera right now. So it is, uh, <laughs> it's a little bit tricky to reflect it here. But if you're gonna have your flap get caught, it is right here. And you're gonna see, see where I'm struggling right there? See that tissue? The tissue from the tooth around the follicle, it gets caught right around there. And it's just a little bit more dense tissue. And look, I'm all the way down, I'm full thickness, all the way to the bone. I do not need to flap it all the way to the angle. I have as much as I need to see. I'm gonna push that lingual back a little bit. And there's my 45 degree angled hand piece. I can see everything. You can see, you can see the entire tooth there. You don't need to make a massive flap. You just need to make it big enough that you can see everything and you can safely take out that tooth uh, without causing further issues. And so uh, uh, in cases where, sorry, in cases where, you know, it's a full horizontal, full impaction and you need to make a larger flap, you can. And you can see I've made a large flap here. I can get to this entire tooth. I haven't done any bone removal yet. But you can flap the whole mandible if you want to to get to that tooth. It's the exact same flap design, but you may go a little bit further ahead and it's going to be a nice 45 degree back here. But you can't tell me you can't see everything there. It's nice and clean. All right. So after you've taken out teeth, we need to manipulate how we heal. I don't think the actual surgery is the hard part. I think babysitting after is the hard part. I think you make or break your rep reputation on your post-op. And so this is where you need to show your patients you care. And this is where we need to make them heal. And we'll do anything to make them heal because we're trying to avoid complications, right? We don't want them to get infected. We got to have a nice clean surgery. We need to rinse our flaps after you take that tooth out and to make sure you don't leave any infection behind. We don't want to have dry sockets. We're going to talk about this. We avoid dry sockets at all costs. I'll maybe see. I don't know, one dry socket every couple of years because of the protocols we have in place. Uh, you need to be able to take out teeth efficiently. If you're working on a tooth for an hour and a half, yeah, they're probably gonna end up with a dry socket no matter what you do. You cause a lot of trauma to the area. Bleeding, we need to minimize bleeding. We need to know, uh, you know our anatomy and we need to be respectful of the anatomy. And no matter how hard a tooth is to come out, we do not compromise on where we're going to be um, you know, cutting or, 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 or pushing because we need to respect the anatomy and we need to respect the, the blood vessels in the area. And more, most importantly, pain. If we are able to control pain for our patients and, and you know, long-term pain, that will just work out so much better for all of us. And this is where you'll build your reputation right here. And this is where PRF shines. Um, show of hands, who here uses PRF? I hope to see 80% of you uh, holding up your hand here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, PRF has changed the way I practice dentistry. And if you've taken a PRF course, or if you've been student in your practice, I know it has changed your, your practice too. And you can use PRF across everything. Whether it's not just extractions, it's soft tissue grafting. Um, I just read an article yesterday about the, uh, uh, there's some crazy endo applications that, that they're using it for. People are using it for cosmetics. They're using it for everything. I had a version of, of PRF, but, but PRP um, injected into me for uh, um, like for, for my uh, shoulder healing. And so it's, it's crazy. And what PRF is, okay, is an autologous platelet concentrate. So what that means is we take blood from the patient. We don't do anything to it. We literally just collect it in a tube and put it in a centrifuge. It is so ridiculously easy. There is no manipulation of the actual blood. 
it is the patient's blood that we're going to manipulate. We're not adding anything to it. The reason why we call it LPRF is because we're able to capture all the leukocytes into the PRF. So leukocytes are white blood cells. What do we want around an area to allow it to heal faster? White blood cells. So we're going to incorporate white blood cells here. And inside this PRF here, inside this autologous, autologous platelet concentrate, are all our growth factors. Okay, these growth factors are cell signals, and they're going to they're going to call upon mesenchymal stem cells around the area and other cells like fibroblasts to, to come to the area to allow for healing. Inside inside this PRF here, okay, is all the growth factors that will slowly be released from that PRF. And PRF, you add it to any extraction socket, it heals so much faster. I have patients come to me that I've never seen before and they were referred to me. And the first thing that they do is they hold out their hand and they say, I heard you're taking blood from me. You're going to make me heal faster. Just like my neighbor. And I'm like, yeah, we're, we're going to take PRF. I put PRF in all extraction sockets and I encourage you guys, uh, I encourage you, especially for third molars, put it in your socket. You have nothing to lose. It's going to allow it to heal so much faster. It doesn't cost you anything. You're using the patient's blood. And so this is the procedure. We take, we do vein and puncture, which means taking blood out of the arm. Okay, immediately throw it in the centrifuge. Okay, so you have to take you have to take like multiples of tubes. You can't just take one tube. You have to balance your centrifuge. So you either take two, four, six, eight. Okay, and then you separate it after it comes out of the machine. You there's there's three layers. There's the plasma layer up top, which is like a, a clear layer. We have our PRF in the middle here, and then we have our red corpuscles on the bottom. This is the money layer. This is what we want to collect. Okay, this is where all of our our, uh, our growth factors are and, the leuc and our leukocytes. And you can see that over here. So the cool part about PRF, and once you've done it before and you've actually held PRF and you've manipulated it because it's so stretchy, it, it's a fibrin clot. And the growth factors are released over 10 to 14 days through intricate cell signaling within the PRF. The actual growth factors are released for 10 to 14 days while everything is healing. Why wouldn't you want growth factors to be released constantly while it's healing? It's calling upon other cells to come to the area to form new blood vessels to heal. Wound healing at its finest, all because of this PRF that we're going to add. We're basically, by putting PRF in the socket, we're, we're telling new blood vessels to form, which is creating angiogenesis, which is creating new blood flow to the area. This is why it works so well around dry sockets. And so this is what it looks like here, okay? If you're having a tough time understanding this, I want you to think of my favorite cake. I know I'm weird. I love Jello cake. I don't know what it is. If I'm gonna have a birthday, it's gonna be Jello cake. And so, this is what I want you to think about. Okay, your Jello is your fibrin. Okay, the fruit in the inside are your platelets and your leukocytes. I hope that makes sense to you. I don't know how else to explain it to you, but just think about it that way. And if you look under a scanning electron microscope, this is exactly what we see. We see a fibrin on the outside, and we see our uh, white blood cells and our platelets along the inside. So that's really cool. And this is exactly why, because we're promoting angiogenesis, we're, we're promoting healing to that area. This is why we see a reduction of dry sockets, localized osteitis is dry sockets, 95%. And there's multiple studies to show this. And why not incorporate this into your site? So this is what it looks like out of the out of the centrifuge. We see our three layers. We see our PRF. We see our red corpuscles. We see our acellular plasma here, and that's what it looks like. You just pick it up with a pair of tweezers. You can use a blade or a pair of scissors. Wipe off the red corpuscles, and from there, it's ready to go, and it goes right in, right into the socket there. And we're going to supercharge healing to that site. Okay. With that being said. I want to make sure you rinse your flap really well. You get rid of all extra follicular tissue. We want to supercharge healing. I want everything to heal well. And that's why I add PRF to the site. This is such a huge trick. I encourage all you guys to do that. Um, and, and if you haven't, um, you know, heard about PRF or, um, you know, you don't feel confident enough to do the vein puncture, I just want to remind you, you guys do IAN blocks all day and you can't see the nerve, and you're injecting a needle this big into someone's mouth, but yet you can feel a vein here, you can inject it three, or you can you know, take blood, you're only poking someone three millimeters in. It's so easy. You just need to get someone to show you how to do it, and uh, I'd be happy to show you guys how to do it. I have so many vein of puncture tips and tricks. It's, it's all I do now, so. So this is what it looks like here again. 
clean socket. It's already been rinsed. It's already clean. PRF goes right in the socket. Notice my suction here. I don't want the patient to swallow. You know, when you push on the PRF, plasma comes out. And then you got to be careful. You don't want your assistant to suck up your PRF. It'll make a nice loud noise. And then, you know, your head drops because now you got to do it again. But uh, it, it's quick and easy. You literally just put it in the socket. And lastly, you need the right tools for the right job. I am not going to use those, those big fat elevators to take out teeth. I need to, I need to take out teeth efficiently and effectively. But what that also means is I need to be able to trust my tools. I remember in my first year where I started taking out more and more wisdom teeth, I broke a 46 R uh, when I was taking out uh, a one eight. Imagine how you would feel searching for that tip of that 46 R. I turned the instrument and looked at it. And it was one of the, you know, when you, uh, you know, when you buy a practice and you inherit, inherit instruments, and it was an old elevator. And my old boss used to buy a whole bunch of crap on, on the internet from like, you know, cheap, cheap sites. I'm sure the elevator wasn't even old. It was just busted crap. And I didn't even notice. I thought I got rid of all of them. And my assistant handed it to me and I used it. And that's my mistake, man. I've learned my lesson and I'm never going to do that again. I believe in having, you know, great dental equipment and, and I like nice cars and I like nice things. And so I, I always want the best of everything and the best instruments you can get on the market, hands, bars, none is Carl Schumacher instrument. It's like literally driving. It's like the, the version of driving a Ferrari versus a Honda. If, if, if Hugh Freedy's a Honda, this is your Ferrari right here. It's a Carl Schumacher instrument. They have a phenomenal warranty. They're built to last. I think Jazz are, and Ho Young spoke about approximators yesterday. Carl Schumacher also makes approximators. Um, but this right here is my favorite instrument. I think every aspiring, you know, uh, exodontist or anyone that pulls a lot of teeth, this is my go-to for third molars. Uh, I get a lot of questions on this. Um, not every Cogswell B is the same. Okay, this is a different Cogswell B. Only Carl Schumacher makes it. It's a it's a modified Cogswell B. So it's the ELE seven six six O and uh, K, and the K is the modified version. And I use the Cogswell B to lever off the bone. I got videos here to show you. It's between the bone and the tooth for all maxillary teeth. Um, like I said before this webinar, I did two sets of third molars this morning, and then ran home just for you guys here. And I got to go back and I got a couple more in the afternoon, but in all my kits, this is my main instrument. I have so many in the office because this is what I use for all third molars. And I, and I feel it works really, really well for me. Where it really shines is because of this small rounded point. And this is where a lot of Cogswell bees are different. So this is why I highly recommend this one here. It has a thin pointed end and this part here is longer and that's great for upper third molars. But this is what, I use for a lot of teeth and it's because of this and it's because of a, a purchase point and what a purchase point is is uh, a purchase point is what we can use inside teeth to really lever them out so you can make a hole in the tooth and I show you how to do this I just don't have time for this right now but uh, we make a hole in the tooth and then I insert the Cogswell B in here and lever off the bone and up and the teeth pop out now your tooth cannot be fully solid when you do that. You'll just break the crown. It's when teeth start to, to get mobile and you just can't, you know, they're just moving around in there and they're just not jumping up. And I'll show you a video of it here. So you can either make a hole or you can use the pulp chamber for that. So after you split the tooth and I have a video of just that here. So I've split the tooth here. Okay. And you see it's moving, but I can't get it to pop up. You see that? Like I just, I can't get it to pop up. I don't like putting a ton of force. There's my Cogswell B levering off the bone. Hope you guys saw that there. And now Cogswell B just on the bone there, pops it back. I find that this is the money tool, the 7660K from Carl Schumacher. Um, it, it's, it's a game changer. And for me, it's, it's my favorite tool. Um, and I, during our course, I show you how to use it and everything. I just wanted to introduce it for you guys here. Um, I get a lot of questions on what my actual kit is, and this is my kit. Um, I am not affiliated with Carl Schumacher. I do not get paid for anything. I just believe that they have badass instruments. And so um, talking with them, I'm always talking with them. And I said, if I'm going to hold a course, I need to have your support to, to show people what I use. And since I'm already using Carl Schumacher instruments, 
I feel really good about telling you guys and telling everyone that they are the best instruments. And uh, yeah, full disclosure, I'm not paid for any of this. I just think that they are the best. And in my kit, the two things I think sep separate my kit apart from all the other kits are the modified Cogswell B. And I use pot elevators as well for really high upper rates, but we're not talking about that today. That's, that's more of an advanced course um, scenario. But I have a third molar kit with Carl Schumacher. And this is, this is your gift, I guess, for joining the presentation today. I reached out to Carl Schumacher in the US and their Canadian distributor, um, that is their brand new Canadian distributor, is Hasira Med, HMI Med, based out of the GTA. And they have all, they've both said, I don't know if everyone here is, is uh, American or Canadian, but they have both said that they're going to give us all 20% a, a off access to their websites. So that's to buy anything. So if you're gonna buy approximators or you wanna buy a modified Cogs LD or if you wanna buy the kit, everything is 20% off. I think this is huge. I'm probably gonna buy some more too because it's 20% off and it's valid for the next uh, two weeks here. I highly encourage you guys. It's a great deal. You're buying the you're buying the best of the best. So uh, this is just what I use, and uh, I encourage you guys to check it out. And I'm, I know Jazz talked about the, the approximators yesterday, so uh, that's that's a pretty sweet deal. So Monday morning, asterisk post COVID. Okay, we're allowed back to work. What are we gonna do? Let's check out this. Let's check out this three eight here. I'm just gonna minimize this screen here a little bit. Check out this three eight. Okay. Let's uh, let, let's see where we're at. We got this white line here. I think I can see it, but I can't really see it maybe. So what are we gonna do? We should probably take a cone beam, okay? And then how are we gonna take out this tooth? Okay, so now we can see it. I think I can see a white line there. I'm unsure, but we do see darkening of the roots. And what did I tell you guys? When you see darkening of the roots, that's a sign that there could be nerve, um, could be nerve involvement. When I look at the CBCT, I'm going to check for position of the nerve. I'm going to check for position of the cortical plates. Um, I'm going to check for cortication of the IAM. Okay, but looking at this tooth here, I know that there's bone over top here. I'm going to have to create space. I know I didn't talk about how to create space and everything today. We only have an hour, but I would cut and make space within the socket. So I'd, I'd make a... Uh, we see the bone over top. We can see we have a safe zone here. Remember our roots aren't touching here. This is the, the, you know, the section I would make just to get to this tooth. And then I would consider maybe a purchase point here after I got it loose and pop it up. So that's what I'm thinking about. Um, remember what I told you about the pans, make sure that there's space in between here. And I should be able to get that tooth out. So let's see how it goes. And mind you, this is a typical Monday morning. You just took my 45 minute webinar. You, you, I hope you learned something. And here we go, okay? So we're at this tooth. Let's take a cone beam first. We can see the IAN here. Look how close they are, but also look at this. Our root is embedded in the cortical plate. There's a thinning of the cortical plate here. Look how close it is. Okay, so I'm warning the patient, you know, there are possible nerve issues here. But you get this flap, you just took my course, you can't remember exactly where this flap goes. Or you're looking through a camera making a flap, one of the two. <laughs> okay, you didn't make a perfect 45 degree there, but that's okay. We're still gonna make a full thickness flap here, okay? So this, is, this could be a typical case for you. Not every flap is going to be super clean and, and that'll be okay. You just have to make sure after you get through it, you're on solid bone here. Okay, I show you everyday scenarios. I don't want to show you beautiful surgeries that, that we can all do every day. We don't learn from that. This is an everyday surgery here. So now I know it's tough to see with the, with the Minnesota in place there, but I'm fully on bone. You can see bone all along here. We're beyond the periosteum, it's full bone, okay? We're gonna uncover this tooth. This is all real time, okay? We can use a round bird to uncover that tooth. Uh, we talk about birds during our course. Um, a lot of different types of birds you can use. I'm just using a round bird here. I'm exposing that tooth. Okay, we're taking our time. We don't need to. We don't need to make this erase. I'm removing a bit of that distal bone. Allows me to get to that tooth. But now I need to cut the back half of that tooth right off. Okay, I need to make space. I'm doing a little bit of buccal bone removal. I'm splitting that tooth. You can see that right there. It's really hard to film at the back of a mouth, but. Uh, um, you can see what I'm doing there. 
we have a, a, a sea sponge here in place, a weeder retractor, so nothing gets swallowed by the patient. You can see I'm just splitting that back half of the tooth away. Okay, not putting that much force, popping that up. Okay, and then what, what instrument am I gonna use? Right there, Cogswell B, modified Cogswell B. And then I go to my app, my uh, application point. I could just use, you know, a Ron, pair of Ron Jers to pull that out there, but that's okay. Right in the application point, get it to push distally because now I have space within my socket and up it comes. Tooth is gone. It's all in one piece. You can see it there. And PRF, or you rinse the site and PRF goes in the socket. So that's Monday morning lower. And then in the afternoon, you got to see another one up top here. I know we didn't talk about maxillary ones today, but I'm still going to highlight my favorite tool, and that's the Cogswell B. Okay, it's a, it's a partial bony up there. We're going to have a clean flap. If you notice the position of my Minnesota, I'm not going to let anything slip behind that tooth. When I am putting pressure on that tooth, that Minnesota is preventing me from pushing that tooth distally. I know we didn't talk about it today, but uh, you do not want to lose your tooth in the infratemporal fossa. That is a, a horrible, horrible, not only a horrible day, it's a horrible year for you. That'll, uh, that'll make you question everything you're doing. But uh, that, that's my safety. This is my safety right here. Okay, I'm holding that always in place, providing distal pressure. Now I can see the tooth here. And all I'm going to use is my periosteal to remove the bone all along the tooth. You can see it there. It's a clear, easy access to the tooth. My application point is just right there. I'm sure you guys can see it. I'm gonna keep on moving. I have nice, clean access to that tooth. And then I'm gonna use my modified Cogswell B. And I'm just gonna roll it. And if you look at my position of the Minnesota, that's keeping everything safe, okay? I'm not gonna let the patient swallow that tooth because you can see I have a sea sponge with a weeder retractor holding it in place, nothing can slip down that patient's throat. This is, this is an extremely safe procedure. And that's it. I hope you guys, uh, uh, I hope you guys got, you know, something out of today. It's, it's hard making a lecture for people with varying experiences, but um, those are five things that I do on a daily basis. And I think that have really helped me. Um, like I said, if you guys are interested in, uh, in volunteering or want to, you know, learn more about our water project, um, we're in the process of actually making our own charity to uh, uh, to expand the project across the world, and, and I'm really excited on on you know the future of that. Uh, COVID kind of threw a wrench into into our trips. We don't know what we're doing next year now, um, but uh, yeah, uh, send me an, send me a message on Instagram, and uh, we'll connect from there. I was uh, great virtually meeting you guys, I guess. And uh, very humbling that you guys asked me to, uh, to, to share my passion with you guys today. So uh, I hope to meet you guys in the future and uh, we will be having some like, you know, full third molar courses. And uh, if, you, if you guys wanna learn more about them, just, just reach out. Uh, thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Nagi, it was very informative in so many different ways. Our our chat lines are blowing up. Everybody wants to, you know, ask all these questions. You know, what's what, when is Nikki speaking next? Can you talk about this? Can you talk about that? So, um, you know, hats off to uh, Dr. John Sanderson and Ziad Hamad. They're working overtime behind the scenes to make sure that they get all these questions answered. So now we'll try our best to get to as many of them as possible. Um, just because Dr. Jamal does have to run off to uh, take care of some more aids, but before we do so, we're going to do some quick housekeeping. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please make sure that you type in your name and email address into the chat, into the chat group for CE verifications. There's been a lot of questions about videos from uh, yesterday and today. They will be uploaded on our Dentistry Academy YouTube page. So please make sure you subscribe in order for you to watch the videos and get the latest updates. Also, please follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn to receive all of the latest information of our upcoming talks this upcoming week. Uh, and once again on Monday uh, at 11 a.m., we will start off week four with Ms. Melissa Calloway, who will be talking to us on how to build your network to jumpstart your return to practice, followed by Dr. Mike Ling, who will be talking to us about how to double your case acceptance. So make sure that you sign up today, dtacademy.ca, and as always, the password is TRACK20, all caps. I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to my co-hosts, Dr. Hamad and Dr. Sanderson, for some Q&A. Awesome. 
Thank you. This was uh, it was an incredible presentation. Um, I got to say, like just the way the way it was outlined and everything, it truly does live up to the name. You know, it's simplifying third molars, and um, I yeah, we've, we've had a ton of questions, and I think that just tells you how great that was. So, thanks, man. <laughs> um, we're gonna start off with the first question. Um, from anonymous during wisdom tooth extractions if pressure is uh, not stopping the bleeding what is the next step uh i need more info <laughs> it, it oh, depends like what what i do is <laughs> yeah you, it depends where where you're cutting or depends uh, kind of what what's involved for a simple you know normal extraction um, you can definitely usually pressure gets 90% out of them. I would anesthetize the soft tissue all around there. Um, make sure your anesthetic has epi in it. Uh, you need to determine it's coming from the soft tissue or hard tissue. Um, you can try uh, trans transazemic acid, um, like a, a rinse, and you can actually put some on a sponge and, and, and like on gauze and, and put it onto the socket. And that's helped in the past. Um, but it depends if it's if it's upper or lower. It depends where it's coming from. Um, did you, yeah, it's, it's tough. Those are my usual go-tos first. And then we always put PRF in there that helps stop bleeding as well as you can try a collagen sponge as well. All right. Okay. And, uh, the following question is also anonymous. Uh, would you consider prescribing steroids after significant bone removal? And if so, what would you uh, specifically prescribe? So I usually, uh, I prescribe, uh, dexamethasone for everything. Like whenever I take out third molars. Um, be careful of diabetics and uh, I usually go uh, IV but if you're not going to do IV uh, you can do like four milligrams BID for a couple days. Okay. Hey Neki, fantastic uh, presentation. I've got a couple more questions over here. The first one is from Eric um, and his question was uh, was regarding the buffering of your uh, local anesthetic and he asks yeah. is buffering your LA safe for all injections and do you find it is ever contraindicated? Uh, I haven't found a contraindication. We're just increasing the pH. If you're using, like if you're, if it's old, like if you buffered it and then you're using it tomorrow, remember precipitate forms in there. So I wouldn't use that. Like if it's a fresh buffering, I don't see why, why it wouldn't work. And I only do it for lower blocks. Um, I find uh, infiltrations kick in pretty quick. And so it's the lower blocks that we're trying to, you know, keep the pain down and we want them to kick in faster. So that's when I would use uh, buffer anesthetic for that. Awesome. Thank you. And, uh, and Alice has the next question. You may have just answered it. Um, she asks how stable is the buffered LA? And if we don't use the carpule that day, would we have to throw it out before the next day? Yeah. So throw it out for the next day. It's not stable. Um, I wouldn't keep it for more than a couple hours. Um, um, but it is effective and it's so cheap to get. Like I know there's companies out there that make, I think it's like on pharma, or something like that, that make buffered solution and it's expensive, you're just gonna go to your pharmacy and get sodium bicarbonate, 8.4%. It's 40 or 50 bucks for a 50 milliliter vial. You're using 0.2 ml at a time. So that lasts a lot and, it's, and it works really well. Okay. And awesome. um, we have a question from uh, Mohammed is asking, um, and a, a couple other people as well. So they're asking about the name of the app um, that you're using for um, LA. Yeah, it's, the ADSA. I'll, uh, yeah, ADSA. I'll open it up right now on my phone. Um, if I can find it here. I got too many, uh, too many apps. Yeah, it's the ADSA 10 minute app. It looks like, oh. yeah, it's just ADSA. Okay. Yeah. And, and a, just a quick reminder easy. to all. Um, who may have missed a, a quick uh, a quick uh, word that uh, Dr. Jamal had mentioned? You can uh, you can rewatch uh, you know portions of the presentation on the YouTube channel later. Just a quick yeah. reminder. Yeah, it's like a. Oh, I guess you can't see my screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another question, and it's uh, just a, a quick uh, reminder. I think like uh, it was mentioned in the uh, presentation as well. How much sodium bicarbonate? Would you recommend to be added again for each carpule for buffering? Point, Is it 0.1 or point point 0.2? 0.2 cc. Yeah. Point two yeah. cc. Yeah. Yeah. You just want it like you're just adding enough. It pushes the software out a little bit, but nothing crazy. Yeah. Perfect. 
Our, uh, our next question uh, comes from Mohammed, and it's um, regarding a CBCT. Um, he mentions it's not practical for every dentist to purchase a CBCT. Of course. Um, what do you, if a patient is in pain, like that, uh, that example of the 22-year-old in extreme pain, what do you do? Do you, are you still sending to, um, you know, Canaray for a, um, a workup first? Or how do you uh, approach that? Um, I, I have a CBCT in my office, so I don't uh, send. But um, in that situation, I think safety trumps anything. And I think if you're going to be taking on a case, it's, it's your responsibility to make sure that you have all the information. Um, having post-operative problems or medical emergency because you know you, you didn't know the full information, I think that would fall upon the dentist. And uh, I think getting that information is crucial. And so I think anyone would respect um, the fact that you want to do you know the best for the patient and, and uh, I would get the necessary information. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next question um, is kind of continuation of, uh, of your chat with Mark Chan before the lecture. And he asked, would you consider printing a model of a distoangular tooth as a diagnostic tool for both you and the patient? His example is isolating um, the DICOM file, specifically printing in dual color, isolating the nerve. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> and we, may, we may have to get him to jump on here too. If, uh... <laughs> I would appreciate that. Um, I have 3D printed uh, teeth before. And as part of our course, we had a 3D printed um, horizontal. Um, and it was actually from like an NHL player. I took out his wisdom teeth and I'm like, hey, I'm going to teach how to teach other people how to take out your wisdom teeth. We print, we milled, no, printed the model and milled the tooth and yeah. inserted the tooth in the model. But I bet you Mark can do that a lot <laughs> I think my question was basically because you can take a CPTC scan and like very short amount of time isolate that section. And now with like Canaray has a dual color printer, you can isolate the nerve. So you can basically, yeah. practice, if it's not an emergency situation, you can practice the surgery as a new doctor directly on a 3D printed model to, to gauge spacing for like, you know, to visualize the case. I mean, you're very experienced, but for a younger dentist that might not have that experience, it's kind of nice to gauge the space in real time because you can isolate your so CPT file. Is the tooth separated from the- You can like, if, you, if you want, or you can just print really? the whole piece, yeah. Man, that's you, pretty badass, man. And you can also make it clear so you can see through it. Yeah, see, that's the ones I've seen have been clear, but yeah. no, I, Anyways, I, I haven't done it for like a pre-op case, but that's pretty cool, man. I like that. Unreal. Um, so moving on to the questions, uh, another anonymous question. For the hockey stick part of the incision, are you cutting all the way to bone along that incision? Mm-hmm, 100% of the time. I cut to bone, yeah. Yeah, you never want to have like partial thickness. It's always, you cut the bone. And another anonymous question. For the hydraulic flap, are you injecting the LA to make the flap bubble before or after you make the flap incision? You have to do it before because you want, you're reflecting your flap. So you, you inject it before, then you make your incision, then you take your periosteal and it literally just falls right off the bone. And you can apply that to anywhere in the mouth. It just doesn't have to be on the lower part. Awesome. Next couple questions, uh, Nagy, come from uh, Darren. Um, his first one being, uh, what are your, maybe a little discussion, but your, your thoughts on performing coronectomies? Yeah, absolutely. In high risk scenarios, you have to do a coronectomy. I don't think it's uh, like you have to go through informed consent with your patient, of course, but if you think that there's a high risk of, you know, paresthesia, um, consider a coronectomy. There's various rules to, to doing a coronectomy, like you have to make sure you're, there's no enamel left on the tooth and, and the tooth is three millimeters uh, below the bone, um, like the final uh, point of bone that you have. You cannot have any infection in that tooth before you do the coronectomy. Um, so if you're, if you're comfortable enough doing that, I think a coronectomy is a phenomenal procedure in certain scenarios where it needs to be done. Um, there's always the unintentional coronectomy where you just can't get a tooth out. So, and, and it turns out those patients are okay too. Uh, his second question being, uh, do you only block with Marcane or infiltrate as well? And do you only use Marcane at the end of the procedure or at the outset? Um, I block with Marcane and then I'll add a little bit on along the buckle. And it's, I usually like, as you get, I'm not saying I'm the fastest at taking teeth out and I will never say anything about that. But like, 
you inject it and then like 20 minutes later your surgery is done or maybe an hour later your surgery is done whatever uh whatever stage you're at and it's still in there right so i usually do it all at once it's, it's just easier um but then i will inject some um especially if it was a tougher one i will inject all around the buckle as well okay awesome. so now, Eric is asking, are you including PRF application into the extraction fee or are you uh, billing out and um, an additional fee for it? And that question was, um, was asked by a, f a few other people as well. Sure. Um, that's, I, you know, I get that question a lot. Um, I, I really like this part of my course. I talk about creating the third molar experience. And if I can create that third molar experience, it pays dividends for me. Um, it takes me no time to use, uh, to get PRF, especially if I'm doing IV, it's, it's all the same needle. Um, I do not charge for it. I guess it would be in my extraction fee. Um, but I know a lot of dentists do charge for it. And I think you have all the right to charge for it. Um, if it makes my patient heal faster, um, I just include it in the fee. Insurance isn't going to cover it. I don't like having those conversations. I don't feel like I need to. Um, patient's already in the chair. It's my responsibility to make them heal. And that's just, that's just how I feel about it. And uh, from uh, Sandra Nada, she's um, is asking, what is your opinion regarding the risk of embolism while cutting the bone with high-speed handpiece? We're using a 45-degree angled handpiece with air going through the back, so there's no so, air going to the area. It's a surgical handpiece. There's there's no risk of embolism. If you're using like a operative handpiece, what you use for crown and bridge. Um, then yes, that's that's a high risk for an embolism, and we will not be doing that. No. Yeah. Awesome. Next few questions are related to a PRF application. Um, a, lot, a couple of them are, are just quick questions. But how many PRF would you place in a third molar socket, personally? As many as, many as you want. There's there's no there's no doubt. As many as you want to squeeze in there. I usually just do one. But um, like like I said, you have to take PRF in pairs, right? Like you can't just take one tube of blood. You have to balance your centrifuge. So if you have two, um, like you say you've taken out one tooth and you have two PRF tubes, then I'd put both in there. But if I'm like taking out a set of third molars and I'm putting them in on the bottom, I just take two tubes and one on each side. Makes sense. Awesome. And uh, along those lines, do you ever use uh, PRF to treat dry socket? Absolutely. Yeah. If you do get a dry socket, um, we need to incorporate angiogenesis back into that area. Um, I don't know if what I do, like before I put the PRF in helps, like I always, if I do suspect a dry socket, I always anesthetize and I cure at the area to create bleeding. I don't know if that fixes it or my PRF and I'll never know. You'll never know. Right. So I just do everything. Like I'll freeze the patient, cure at the area, um, put the PRF in and then stitch it, stitch it up and, and you never really see those patients again. Awesome. Okay, and I'm just making sure, I think another one on PRF here is, are there certain cases where you feel PRF would be more indicated than others? Sounds like you're a, you're a fan of it everywhere, but... Uh, I like it. It's, like, man, it's like ketchup, you put it on everything, right? That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think it would hurt you. Like, I, I don't know why you wouldn't use it. And that uh, makes sense. Um, do you follow up uh, after putting uh, PRF and, and for how long after? What do you mean follow up with just because of the PRF? I, 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 yeah, looking at the question, I mean, maybe if you're following up due to the extraction itself, I think you're doing the yeah. same, but I didn't I never follow up due to the PRF. I follow up with the patient due to the extraction. Yeah, I don't, like, it doesn't matter if I put PRF in there or not. I always follow up with the patients. Okay. And I think we are, uh, uh, we're going to leave the time here quickly, yeah. but I think Ziad's got one more, uh, one more question for Ziad. Right. So this is a, a bit uh, a bit off topic, uh, uh, Neki. Uh, some people are asking your your eyeglasses, your eyewear are incredible. They're iconic. Where are you getting them from? <laughs> man, I can't tell you that. That's my secret. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm a I'm a I I don't I don't have a lot of like uh, the two things I like in life are good extraction tools and nice glasses, and, and I got my fair share of both. So uh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> that was funny. Awesome. That's perfect. So um, I would like to thank our co-hosts for the day, doctors uh, Mike Ling, John Sanderson, and Ziad Hamad. Well done, guys. You guys did an incredible job. And we'd thank like you. to thank our speaker for the day, 
uh, Dr. Neki Jamal for such an incredible presentation. You're a true gift to the industry. You're a true gift to the profession. You're a true gift to healthcare in general, uh, Neki. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, brother. And you know, as I said, your story is an inspiration for so many. And uh, you're, you're a great example and a role model that every dentist and every healthcare practitioner should be very proud to have uh, you in, in our industry. So thank you for all of that. Bro, man. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that wraps up things for the day, guys. Thank you guys all so, uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. This wraps up our week three. So we're looking forward to our final week. That's week four. We have a group of 12 speakers. Um, I'm going to even list some. Melissa Calway, Mike Lynn, Rachel McKay, Anand Sony, Julie Bordeaux, Has Mustafa, Mona Patel, Tina Kokosis, Jake Carrier, Michael Rondinelli, Nahid Mohammed, and we're finishing things up with Dr. Mian Quek dtacademy.ca make sure you guys sign up have a great weekend stay safe go outside enjoy the weather and thank you guys and we'll see you on monday at 11 a.m see you guys